What's going on, my good people? Mike Hidalgo here. Thank you for joining us on another FCP Euro DIY. Today, we're going to be working on a 2008 BMW 328xi E91. Today on the E91, we're going to be covering a clutch and flywheel replacement. This is going to be applicable to all your E9X chassis vehicles with an N52 or an N51 and a manual transmission. In front of us, we have quite the slew of parts. It may look a little bit intimidating, but don't worry, we're going to get through it. A lot of this is parts that are necessary, and some of it are parts that are preventative maintenance. It's going to be dependent on the vehicle and what you're working on. As an example, this happens to be my personal vehicle. It has 245,000 miles on it. Everything from the clutch back is original. So we're going to replace everything that we can and everything that we need to while we're at it. So this is kind of the while you're in their uh, parts list. All these parts are listed on the website at fcpo.com and also linked in the description below. What we have, just to kind of go over it quickly, is a Luke or L-U-K flywheel and clutch kit. The flywheel kit is obviously just a flywheel on its own. It already has a new pilot bearing installed. It's pretty much ready to rock and roll. The clutch kit includes your pressure plate, your clutch disc, the fork, the alignment tool, a couple bearings. It includes the throw bearing and a couple other odds and ends. To that, we have added a lot of hardware. A lot of the hardware that we're going to be encountering today is one-time use. Uh, so that's what's kind of sitting here in the middle. We have some flywheel bolts. We have some drive shaft bolts, uh, something for the flex disc. We have some bell housing bolts. A lot of those are aluminum one-time use. In addition to that, we have a couple extras which are sitting on the other side of the table, if you will. Some of you may need this. Some of you may not. However, if you can do it, I recommend you do it while you're at it. Uh, we have some bushings for the shifters. Uh, we have some new clips. We have some bushings for the drive shaft, new flex disc or guibos, hardware for that as well, a new center support bearing. Uh, we're going to check the one out on the car. Again, it is original, uh, but if we can, we're going to cover it and show you how to replace that and any other bits associated with that. In addition to that, we have some transfer case fluid, drain plug and fill plug, which are hiding behind these transfer case mounts. This is a good time to service that. And if you haven't already serviced the transmission as well, we have a DIY already up on that with our very own Gareth Foley. And this one was just serviced about 5,000 miles ago. So not going to cover it today, but we do have a video on it. Same thing, we have the guide tube. I'm imagining that after 245,000 miles of the throw bearing riding on said guide tube, it's going to be a little bit grooved up. We don't want to put a new throw bearing on that. So we have one of those as well. And the seal that sits behind it should we need to replace it. This is a lot to cover. However, again, we're going to be showing you as much as we can. You may only need the clutch and flywheel. Maybe you only want to look at how to service your drive shaft and do a center support bearing. This video is going to cover all of that. A couple of things to keep in mind. You think you may need a clutch. It can be a couple of things. Uh, super easy thing to check first is just the fluid level. Obviously, the clutch runs off of the fluid in the brake master cylinder reservoir. Sometimes when your fluid goes pretty bad, it can give you a faulty or a bad feeling clutch pedal service the fluid. That's an easy thing first if you're trying to diag. Uh, moving on from there, usually what tends to happen is the flywheels, they're a dual mass flywheel, they get tired over time. So that's the case on the E91 behind us. The clutch disc is perfectly fine, it grips perfectly good, but you can tell and hear that the flywheel is completely tired. The planetary gears within it are no longer planetary. And they, uh, as you can imagine, we'll show you when we pull it out, this flywheel is nice and tight. You know, a couple millimeters of travel, that's all it should have. I suspect that when we take the old one out, we're going to have a, basically a turntable in front of us. So that's really why we're doing this job today. Uh, you can feel that in traffic, in first gear, just crawling. Uh, it starts bucking the whole car and makes everything a little bit unhappy. Along with that, the flex discs are original. They're starting to crack, so we're going to service those as well. But before we embark on this journey, let's take a look at some of the tools we're going to need for this DIY. All right, my good people, for this job, we're going to need a couple basic tools. They may seem like a lot going on here, but truly, it's a couple standard stuff and then a couple specialty. To see a full list, be sure to pause the screen in just a moment while we'll give you a full detailed list of everything we use today. But in general, you're going to need a large pry bar, a good set of torque wrenches and ratchets. We have everything from a quarter inch drive all the way to a half inch drive, as well as a couple extensions to go with those. As far as specialty sockets go, you're going to need your standard sockets that can go anywhere from 8 mil to 20 mil. Uh, for impacts, we have 16 and 18. Everything else, we just have the chrome ones. Uh, 14 millimeter hex is going to be needed, a T60, a T50, a T30. Uh, we also have a 5 and a 6 millimeter hex. And then a good e-torque socket set. Honestly, you're going to need almost the whole thing. We have everything from an E10 all the way to an E18 here on the table. 
Moving on on specialty tools, what you're truly going to need for this job is a very large extension with a swivel head on the end if possible. This one goes from a half inch drive all the way to a 3 8 drive with a swivel head. I use a little bit of tape on the end so it's not too loose, makes it a little bit easier to work with. On top of that we have a pick, a couple small flat screwdrivers, uh, we may be grabbing a few more as we go through the DIY, but two different kinds of picks are always going to be uh, helpful, especially when dealing with the clips on top of the shifter. For those of you doing the rear main seal, you're going to need the obviously the primer and the glue that comes with those. Uh, CTA 3801, that's going to be your tool to push out the glue on the syringe style tool. We have this uh, multi-use BMW flywheel locking tool. There's also a CTA brand available. Both are going to be linked in the description below for you. Uh, for the exhaust, we have these exhaust hanger pliers. These are CTA 8062. They make life a lot easier when removing the rubber hangers off of the exhaust. A small brass punch, a ratchet strap for the transmission so we can strap it to the transmission jack, which is not pictured but needed, uh, especially if you're doing this on the lift. A couple hammers, and for those of you that are doing the transfer case service, you're going to need a fluid transfer pump of some sort. We're using CTA 7073 today for that. Obviously some brake clean if you want to clean up the area that you're working in, which I recommend you do. Uh, we have some liquor molly installation paste, which will help us grease up some of the bushings and the shifter bushings and the exhaust hangers when we get to that. Uh, also linked in the description below. Power tools make the job a lot easier. This is a pretty general uh, bearing removal and install tool, which I'm going to try to use with the rear main seal to kind of act as a driver. Obviously, there are special tools designed to run those in there, but to be honest, people like you and I, my good people, we don't typically have those at home, especially for a one-time job. So there's a couple ways to go about that. Uh, I like to use a little bit of torque seal on all the hardware that I torque down. A paint pen works great as well. And again, depending on how you're doing this job, if you're doing it on the lift, a transmission jack, a screw jack, those two things are going to come in handy. Uh, otherwise, a floor jack and a couple set of jack stands and a second set of hands is going to be your friend underneath the car working on the garage floor or the driveway. And then if you're doing fluids, like the transmission fluid or the transfer case fluid, make sure you have a catch pan for that as well and some safety goggles and you're ready to rock and roll. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on this DIY. All right, my good people, before we get started, the first thing we're gonna set up here is an engine support bar. This is gonna keep the engine from tilting forward on us when we pull the transmission out and have it out. It can cause the engine to just kinda go forward due to the location of the engine mounts. And seeing as how we have brand new engine mounts on this car from a previous DIY we just did, uh, they're definitely going to be a little bit more stubborn than an old soft pair. So it's, it's going to hurt and help us. So the bar goes in. You have your tow hook, which you can use out of the chassis of your car. This is also linked in the description below if you need the hook itself. Normally, you want to remove the whole cowl and everything if you're taking the beauty cover off. But because we're only accessing the lift point here, if you remove the two 5 mils, you have more than enough wiggle room to get the cover off to the side. So we're just going to kind of get this up. We're just going to set it with some even tension right now to kind of match what the engine's sitting at. And sure, it may move a little bit once we get the transmission out and we may need to come back and adjust it, but for now this will do. So with that, let's go ahead and hop underneath and get started. All right, my good people, we are under the E91. We're going to start by moving some shielding, some plates out of the way. The first, step is, the first big step is going to be to remove the exhaust. Uh, so with that, we have seven eight millimeter bolts it's holding this first uh, skid plate on, a couple 10 millimeter plastic nuts, let's get to it. And we have one 10 millimeter plastic nut holding on this last piece of the first shielding. Keep that together. Then now that we have that removed, we can move on to this rear bracket uh, that sits underneath our tunnel here. That we have eight T50s to remove. We're just going to go ahead and zap them out. All right, with that, we can set this brace off to the side and uh, clean it up for later. Uh, moving on forward though, we're gonna head back just a little bit more. We have a big support brace on the rear subframe to the body of the car. That's in our way. Let's get to that one next. Next, we're gonna remove the rear brace back here. This is held in by two 16 millimeter bolts and three 18 millimeter bolts. So we'll zap out the two 16s first. With the two 16s out, we're gonna move over to the three 18s. And then we can just go ahead and set this crusty baby to the side. All right, my good people, next comes the amazing uh, hardware that holds the uh, header section, cat section to the rest of the mid and center and rear section of the exhaust. If you see snow and salt, then you know that this hardware is notorious for going bad. Uh, sometimes you'll hear an exhaust leak. It's usually this area right here starting to separate. 
These have been replaced, believe it or not, three years ago, and they look like they've never been touched. I've hammered on an 11. I truly couldn't tell you what size nut uh, this was originally, maybe a 11 to 13. Take that how you will. I um, have a 12 millimeter wrench on the other side that I'm gonna use to counter hold. I'm expecting this hardware to break, which is totally fine. Uh, it's already broken before, so we'll be replacing it anyways. But just keep that in mind. Have fresh hardware along with the gaskets for these unions here. There's not much of it left, but it didn't break. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and repeat that same process uh, across the other three. Moving on, my good people, we're gonna work on removing this E10 that holds this bracket, which goes to our transmission and transfer case setup. You can do either or, honestly. You can remove this E10 or you can remove the whole bracket as a whole. What I'm gonna do first is remove this E10. And then once we get ready to drop the transmission, we can remove this bracket later on if we need to. But for now, I just wanna work on the exhaust. So we have an E10 socket. And that comes out. We're just gonna go ahead and set that to the side. We have two screw jacks situated underneath the car right now, uh, just to help us since we're on the lift. So we're gonna start moving back to some of the hangers, get those loosened up, and then uh, I'll grab my buddy Mark or uh, Gareth here and we'll drop the exhaust. We have our uh, fancy exhaust hanger pliers, which we mentioned at the beginning of the video. Uh, the CTA pliers are the best. They make removal of these exhaust hangers so much easier. Doesn't hurt to put a little bit of penetrating fluid on the rubber and metal if these have not been off in a long time, which is the case with this car. And then uh, we'll inspect these bushings when we're done. If we need to replace them, we will. And uh, regardless, we'll link them in the description below for you good people at home. This one is pretty much out as much as it can go. We're just gonna leave this for here. This bushing is tearing, so we are gonna go ahead and replace it. But for now, we're gonna get this other one started a little bit, right? up here behind the actual uh, end of the muffler. And then we'll kind of go back and forth between the two. We'll lower the screw jack a little bit and we should be able to pop both of them off. There's one and we have one more on the end, on the other side of the muffler behind our bumper cover. Let's go ahead and get that one now. All right, our exhaust is fully disconnected. Now we're just gonna slowly lower the screw jacks on both ends. I have two situated right now. And then we're just gonna lift it up and set it out of the way. Now we have the exhaust out. Our next step is gonna be uh, whatever we want. Honestly, my good people, we can do the shielding or we can do the drive shaft. I think while I have you situated here, we're just gonna remove all of the heat shield that's in our way to get to the drive shaft. And then we'll do drive shaft things together. So with that, let's get to it. We have four eight millimeter bolts that we're gonna remove first before we switch over to the 10 mil socket. Some of these are just gonna make the removal of the heat shield a lot easier, uh, especially with these side panels that are kind of in our way. And doing these should give us all the room we need to kind of pull these sides out. With that, I'm gonna switch over to the 10 mil socket. We have a couple 10 mils uh, to remove. Some are gonna be like a speed nut or a speed clip type situation. The others are just a 10 millimeter bolt. First one's gonna be right here. Moving out back, we have a couple more 10. We have one on either side of the shield, and we have another speed nut situation going on up here. All right, my good people, next we're gonna work on removing the front drive shaft. For those of you that watched our oil pan DIY, you'll see that this hardware is pretty fresh because we just finished filming that. These are one-time use E12s, so you definitely don't wanna reuse them. Those are linked in the description below as well. We're just gonna go ahead and use the impact and zap them out. The torque spec is pretty low on these, so they should come out fairly easy. For those of you following along at home without an impact, uh, you can use a small flathead screwdriver. Again, it's not enough power or not enough torque to damage the uh, yoke here or anything like that. So you can use one of those to counter hold, maybe a small uh, pry bar. For today, we're just gonna zap them out. We'll show you that method when we tighten everything down as well. And with those removed, we're gonna do the exact same thing on the front side, on the diff end. But while I have you here, if you remember, we talked about removing the bracket off the transfer case. We're just gonna go ahead and do that now. It's two E10 bolts, and this will make mounting the transmission onto the transmission jack a little bit easier. With this, my good people, don't forget to mark up your drive shafts before you remove them, just so you know, A, what the front and what the rear is, and also uh, you wanna mark them up with the flanges on the differential and transfer case side of things. Just makes life a little bit easier when you reinstall everything the same way it came out. 
four E12s up front. We're using a long extension with our electric impact to zap these out. All right, now we can work on pulling out the drive shaft and give it a little bit of a wiggle. There we go. There's a very, very tiny lip on either end of the shaft. That kind of keys into the output flange on the differential and the transfer case. So sometimes these can get a little bit stuck over time, especially if they haven't been off in a long time. Uh, if it's fighting you, take a very small flathead screwdriver and just give it a couple of taps with a hammer on the flange side of things. You're super gently, you're not trying to damage anything here. You're simply just trying to break the seal free. All right, now that we have that undone, let's work on the rear drive shaft. All right, my good people, next we're gonna work on removing our flex disc. Just as insurance, we're gonna go ahead and mark the flange. Uh, we're gonna use the bottom half here. We're gonna mark the flange on the transmission side of things too. You're not gonna be able to see this, but this is just for us to be able to align it. Uh, similarly, how we did with the front drive shaft, uh, once we get that one back installed. So we just wanna have everything kind of in the same spot. We're doing the same thing with the two halves here. We can do this outside of the car as well, but while I have the paint pen in my hands, so with that, we have 16 millimeter bolts. We have 16 millimeter nuts on the back side to counter hold. Uh, we have three of those. So we're gonna go ahead and start with those first and just zap the 16s out from the other side. There we go, we're gonna keep these together. These are also linked in the description below. They are recommended to be replaced by BMW. So we have those listed for you, my good people. And we're just gonna work our way around. The silver 16s are let me say the ones with the bigger heads, those go into the actual transmission uh, flange itself. So those don't have a bolt on the other side that you need to counter hold. We can just zap those out. Those are also gonna be slightly different than the ones that go through the flange. All right, with that, we have the whole front side undone. Before we do the center support, we're just gonna help keep everything in place and not fall on us. We're gonna move out to the back and do that next. So let's get to it. I'm gonna mark my drive shaft relative to the flange coming out of the differential. I pretty much chose the same side of the drive shaft across the front and back to do all my markings. If you really wanna get crazy with it, even though it's gonna be hard to mix up, there's your R for the rear half of the shaft. Now you'll notice that the back uh, flex disc has E12s and 16 millimeter bolts. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. Same thing, you're gonna to wanna to replace both. We're gonna start with the 16. We'll go ahead and zap those out first. Counter hold with a 16 on the back, and then we'll move over to the E12s. All right, now with the three 16s removed, we can move over to the three E12s. And at first you don't succeed, get a stronger tool. Just a little corrosion making our life difficult, you know? All right, at this point we are fully unbolted from both the drive shaft ends, uh, both the differential and the transmission. Next on our list is gonna be the two bolts that hold the center support bearing in place. We're gonna lower it slowly and it's gonna wanna come out of either end, so we just have to be careful as we lower it. All right, we have two 13 millimeter bolts in the center that hold the center support bearing. We're gonna zap those out and then uh, carefully remove this drive shaft. So obviously this is at an extreme angle. This would never flex like this, but you can see all the cracking and the bushing. This is why we replace them. With the drive shaft out, my good people, we're gonna set this to the side and continue continuing. All right, next we're gonna work on disconnecting the electronic harness going to our transfer case motor. We have two plugs, a smaller one down here, small pick tool. You're actually gonna to wanna to lift up on the front, not the sides. That's what's gonna undo the, uh, the little latch here to allow us to pull this back, just like that. And then we have the bigger connector here, which has a tab that you can press to unlock everything and then just work it off. You may see a little bit of residue there. That was just from me cleaning up with some electrical uh, parts cleaner. There's a lot of oil on here from when we did the oil pan. All right, before we continue on to do anything up here, I'm just gonna remove this 13 millimeter bolt, which holds this bracket in place. If you're worried about mixing up where it goes, there'll probably be marks on the car just from how long it's been on here. Just mark it with a paint pen, something like that. And it'll allow you to remember where the bracket goes back on uh, during installation. This just helps hold some of the under paneling, but it's gonna get in our way when we go to remove the transmission. 
So by removing it now, we're just saving a little bit of time later, Gator. With that, we can move on to the reverse switch. Pretty standard connector. You push in the metal bracket to release it, and then you can just work it off. Look at all that debris in there. That's 250,000 miles of debris, my good people. Uh, but uh, here's that metal bracket. You simply push in just a pinch. If you follow the harness, you'll see that it goes up on the side of the transmission. There's two metal clips that hold it in place. Simply pull it out away from the trans. There's one. Go more forward. There's two. And then for now, we're just going to kind of tuck this up by the headers, by our oxygen sensors. And forget about it. It'll probably be in our way later, but that's okay. We can deal with it then. All right, we have a 13 millimeter bracket up here that you can either choose to remove or leave. I'm just gonna remove it uh, because it's really not doing much anymore. Unfortunately, a lot of the clips that help hold some of the oxygen sensors and cable just have disintegrated over time. And right now we just have one cable holding a, or one cable's being held on by a zip tie to the bracket. So if we can find a replacement quickly, we'll go ahead and swap that out. Now we'll throw it back on later. But this is just one little thing that's gonna be kind of out of our way when we go to do everything and reinstall everything later. Yeah, no problem. So following down, you'll see the oxygen sensors go underneath our trans, held in by a bracket that goes through the bottom transmission bell housing bolts. If you've watched our DIY, you'll learn that not only are the cables different colors, but the plugs are both different. It's impossible to plug uh, one bank into the other bank's connector. Now with that said, they're still marked. Uh, I've marked them here just to save myself two seconds of guessing. When we go to reinstall everything, I'll just see that blue goes with blue and nothing goes with nothing. You don't need to do that, again, if you don't want to, uh, but for me, it'll just make life a little bit quicker. So I'm just gonna go ahead and unplug them, pull them out of their bracket, simply pull, and they're separated. We'll do the same for both and we can just tuck these bad boys over to the side. This metal sheathing kind of does a nice job at helping everything stay out of the way. Those can live there, this can come back down. And if we continue to follow this harness, we'll see that it goes to our oil level sensor unit. We can go ahead and unplug that next. Uh, this is gonna be a pretty standard connector. You have a release tab on either side of the connector, left and right. Simply pinch them and work it off. Sometimes the uh, oil on here can swell these up a little bit and make them a little bit harder than necessary to remove. This one's been taking a bath in oil for the last 200,000, even though we've done the gasket. There we go. And then with that, this harness is pretty much free. This will be able to uh, kind of swing out of the way once we unbolt uh, or loosen some of the bottom bell housing bolts and get this bracket uh, nice, free, and loose. If you want to pop out the rubber grommets or open the alligator clips that hold this harness in place, you can do that as well, which maybe we'll do here just to kind of move it. But for now, that's going to do us. With that situated, this is pretty much going to be the passenger side of the bank uh, of the transmission that we're going to be removing things from on the bottom half. Now we're going to go ahead and work on the slave cylinder. It has two 13 millimeter nuts on either side that we're going to want to remove. For the top one, I have a deep 13 with a small three inch extension, a swivel, and then a longer seven, six inch extension, just so I can get it to come down. You'll probably find a couple different ways to get to that, but for us, that's gonna look a little bit like this, meaning we can put, then go ahead and just zap this baby out. All right, my good people, at this point, the slave cylinder is out. Uh, next on our list, believe it or not, is we're gonna start working on removing this actual transmission out. So we're gonna do a combo of back and forthness. Um, maybe before we get too carried away, we're gonna hop up top and just remove the shift knob, uh, just in case things go really well down here. But it's basically gonna be a combination of removing the transmission mount slash transfer case mount here at the back and removing some bell housing bolts. So we're gonna start with the hardware that we can see easily on the bottom half of the bell housing. Once we get those removed, then we'll go ahead and work on removing the mounts here. That's gonna allow us to bring the transmission down a bit and access the top bell housing bolts. Uh, this will also be a good time to 
drain the uh, transfer case. So we're going to be servicing the transfer case once we have this mount bracket out. So we'll do a little bit of both. It's going to be a little bit weird. Um, but again, for those of you not servicing your transfer case, you can skip that step and just follow along for the bell housing bolts and vice versa. So with that, let's get to it. So we have five E10s that we're going to tackle from down here. We have the E10 on a extension with like a bit of a wobble head, swivel head. We're going to go ahead and just zap these out. Now, something that I personally like to do whenever I'm doing any type of transmission work like this is I'll make myself a little uh, diagram or, or I'll find one online and print it out. Uh, just as a quick example, I've set a row of numbers on the left. I have my numbers here with my torque specs that I did uh, for this DIY ahead of time. And I'm just gonna stick uh, each bolt that I pulled out or each bolt that I will be pulling out based on the position of my diagram and sticking them in the holes uh, as they go on the left. So this is just one way to stay organized even though we're replacing all of the hardware. Uh, I know which bolt to match up and where it goes when we install everything. So just a simple little thing. We have two E10s that hold this bottom uh, O2 bracket in place as well. So when we remove both of these, that bracket will come out. All right, moving over to my left shoulder, we have two more E10s. One more that also helps hold a bracket in place for the soft line for the master or for the slave I'm sorry take that bracket with us and then way up top here on the left you'll see the blue painted head of the bolt there's one more E10 right there see if we can reach this now and just zap it out all right my good people we have two E20s down here by our O2 sensors that we're going to work on zapping out next Right, my good people, those of you might be able to see up there, we have our E20. I had to just reach up with my hand, just like this, and just get the E20 on the uh, next bolt. It's pretty tight, pretty tight fit. We're gonna try to get it from here. Uh, extensions are gonna be the name of the game whenever you're doing a transmission. This one's gonna be no different. Uh, so now I'm just gonna try to reach in there with my extension and get that one out. So now I'm just gonna get in there with our extension. We have a swivel on the end of the extension. That should give us enough angle to get to that socket. All right, and this one can go on our little diagram tool. At this point, we have gotten as far as we can on the bell housing bolts from underneath the car without getting on top of the transmission and using some long extensions. So in order to get to that next is where we're gonna kind of shuffle things a little bit. We're gonna move over to the back by the transfer case. We're gonna remove this transfer case mount bracket. We're gonna bring over the transmission jack, kind of get that loosely situated. Um, and go from there. We have a big bolt that goes through the bracket through our transfer case mount, and then a couple uh, 13s that hold everything in place, or 15s. Just stay tuned to find out. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and just get situated, show you what that's gonna look like so we can support everything and uh, keep it from falling on us. All right, we have the transmission supported with our transmission jack. Now we have an 18 millimeter socket on our ratchet just to kind of hold the end of the nut on this transmission or transfer case mount. 18 on the other side, we're just gonna zap it out. And we'll go ahead and set this to the side. And now we can switch over to our 13 millimeter socket and zap off the uh, surrounding bracket. The three 13s on the driver's side are shorties, at least the initial ones. And on the passenger side, we have uh, 13s that are a little bit longer. We have a total of three of those as well. All right, we're gonna go ahead and set this to the side. And then we'll get ready to lower the transmission a bit and work on the top bell housing bolts. Before we lower, we're just gonna pop this uh, shifted bushing out of the bracket. The bracket is held in by two 10 millimeter bolts if you want to do it that way. However, we are gonna be replacing this bushing. So we wanted to pop out and I just popped it back in by accident. I'm just using a flathead screwdriver and that is gonna be that. We can pull it out now if we'd like. This thing is covered in oil. It's a little bit soft. Uh, not terrible for the mileage that this car has, but for now, if you remember or just remember the notch or the cutout in the bushing faces the top towards the back of the car. It only goes on one way and the bushing also protrudes towards the front of the car uh, when it's installed like so. So we'll just take this one off, set it to the side, and now let's lower this transmission down a bit and get a better view of the last remaining bell housing bolts. All right, so now at this point, my good people, we have the bottom of the bell housing bolts done. We have our transmission transfer case mount bracket lowered. Uh, before we go ahead and do the top bell housing bolts, we're gonna work on disconnecting our shifter. We have a couple fun clips to undo. 
Uh, that's going to allow us to let the shifter either hang out or we can pull it out so it doesn't bind up with us when we try to drop the trans. So with that, we have our pick handy. Let's get to it. So the first thing we're going to do is undo this clip that holds our selector rod to our shifter here. I'm just using a small pick to pull this clip up. This one is also linked in the description below, my good people, if you want to replace your nasty looking hardware like we have here. Surprisingly, this uh, shifted pretty pretty good considering the mileage and the uh, age of the car, um, but it wasn't ideal. I've definitely shifted better, so we're gonna replace all this hardware, grease everything up nicely. It's gonna be a good time. Okay, that's our clip. This selector can get pushed back. Let's see if we can wiggle it out of here. I went ahead and soaked this off camera for a few minutes with some penetrating fluid. That should allow us to get this crusty uh, arm out of here. Man, we're gonna have to do a good job cleaning all this up. This has been in here its whole life and it shows. All right, we're going to visit this in a second. We're going to undo the, uh, you know what, B clips up here. We have one on either side of the shifter. Let's get you a little bit closer in here. Get those popped up and pulled out, and this should allow us to put those brackets up a little bit and maybe allow us to get this uh, shifter arm out. It's a little crusty, so it's putting up a good fight. So let's do that now. This is going to lift up towards you or towards the back of the car. All right, so here's the clip. Just to give you a better view, it was sitting down like so. Went ahead and basically popped it up, pulling it back towards us. Now we're just gonna wiggle it out towards the transmission tunnel. That's gonna release the main uh, rod here so that doesn't hang us up when it comes out. And we're just gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing on the one on the driver's side. Same thing, kinda work that clip up. These are always a pain in the butt. We have new ones of these as well. We're going to replace these just to keep everything nice and fresh with this theme today. Nice and fresh, that's the theme today. Before we continue on the bell housing bolts, we have our mount off. We're going to work on draining the transfer case. So we have our 14 millimeter hex. I have an unnecessary extension here, but it's going to help me break the fill plug first. You always want to make sure that the fill plug is gonna come loose before you remove the drain plug on anything that you're doing similar to this. With that out of the way, we're gonna hop over to the other side and get the drain plug off. And we'll get our 14 millimeter hex in place. Oh yeah, that was nasty. That was nasty and that was good. So that was pretty nasty. Uh, the last time this was serviced was about 175,000 miles. So it's certainly overdue. But now we're at 250. 245 and change, so we'll be good for a little while more, another 50,000 miles. So if we hit the 300,000 milestone, uh, we'll do it again. Now we're gonna work on the top of the transmission bell housing. We have uh, E16 up here that we're gonna get to using an extension and a swivel, and a lot of extensions. Now we're gonna go in with our long extension and our E18 on the end. A little bit of tape on the end of the swivel joint. Uh, just so that I don't have too much play up here. I don't need that much from the angle that I'm approaching at. All right, now over on the passenger side of things, we have two E16s to remove. Same thing, same long extension. Our E16 e torques on the end. We're gonna do our best to get these off next. All right, and now let's go for the top one. All right, my good people, we have two more E16s to get to. Hopefully the shot's a little bit better than what we've been giving you before. I'm just gonna reach in here with the very, very long extension. This is just one of the backing plate bolts, which we can take off later. It's an E12, but I happened to land on that by accident. So I'll go ahead and take it out. My good people, that E12, we just took out simply just because I had a straight shot at it. I think we can get those once the transmission is out. Well, for now, we're gonna go back to our E14 socket. We just had to double check that this was indeed an E14. Now that we're on there, we can go ahead and get that off. At this point, we should have all the bell housing hardware out. 
Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of do a dance with the shifter up top. We've already removed the shift knob, pretty straightforward. You just pop that out and pull it out. We should have all the bell housing bolts loose. Now it's just going to be a dance of getting that shifter out of the tunnel while we also lower the transmission. So we're going to give this a shot and see what we get. All right, so let's get this transmission a little bit level. We're going to talk about a little bit of the struggle of what we ran into with this one that hopefully you don't run into with at home. This should have been much easier, but just due to what happened with the shifter uh, clips up here, it gave us a little bit more of a run for our money. So we'll get a little bit situated and then we'll talk about it. All right, my good people, just wanted to show you real quick kind of what we ran into. It was a little bit of a struggle bus city getting this transmission out. That's because we still had this in place. You saw us pop up these uh, clips and then work the one on the right side out. What happened with the one on the left side is this has been in here for so long, its whole life, that this was pretty much seized inside of the transmission, so we couldn't get it out. And from trying to pop it out, it basically broke the rivet on the end of the plate here, leaving us with just the pin in place. So that made the removal of this whole transmission so much harder. Uh, we tried pushing the pin through the other way. Obviously, we hit the selector rod. It wasn't going anywhere. Uh, so what we ended up doing was just popping the actual uh, shifter arm out of the uh, carrier here. There's a plastic bearing in here that sits, which we're going to be replacing anyways, but it just made life a little bit tougher. So hopefully you don't run into that issue at home. This comes out and you have a lot more room to work with. Um, but with that, we're going to set this to the side for now. We're going to visit it later when we replace the throw out bearing. We'll do the clutch fork and the clip that holds it in place, uh, even the uh, bushing on the end. But for now, Let's head back into the uh, transmission tunnel. We'll do our clutch and flywheel, get that all situated. Uh, we might even visit the rear main seal, and then we'll go from there. All right, my good people, we're going to go ahead and remove our pressure plate next. It's held in by six six millimeter hex bolts. Cool thing you can notice here is notice how expanded the springs here are on the pressure plate. It's a self adjusting plate. So as the car ages and the clutch wears out, uh, it starts adjusting the fingers here so that the feel is the same, essentially. Uh, so this one's fully maxed out. Uh, you'll want to pay close attention to when we install our new one. The springs are going to be really nice and tight. So it's just kind of cool to see uh, how this works over time. We're going to take our six mil on our impact and just zap these out. Make sure your hex head is sitting all the way in. All right, that's our six bolt. Should be some dowels kind of keeping everything in place. Those same dowels will help align our new one in place. Let's get to work this off. We are replacing everything, so in this situation, no one get upset. If you use a little bit of a flat head to separate everything after 250,000 miles, it's understandable. That doesn't want to leave its home. All right. Here is our pressure plate and clutch disc. For the mileage, this is not the worst clutch disc I have ever seen. We're going to go ahead and compare this over to our new one, but you can see the, uh, the grooves in them uh, along the uh, material are pretty much almost even with the face of the, uh, the disc. This is almost like when you see your wear marks on tires being level with your uh, tread. So pretty cool, still grip well, just, you know, noisy, lousy flywheel. Not any, uh, not any crazy heat marks on here. Obviously we weren't doing any drag racing in this car. We wouldn't have won very much. Uh, but looking at our flywheel over here, this is really why we're doing this job. She's tired. There's a lot of spring back or lack of spring back left and right here uh, before it starts interacting with the uh, springs inside, which is really why we're changing this. So in traffic, you hear a lot of like, not too much aft play though, which is pretty amazing considering. Uh, but so with that, let's go ahead and get our next set of tools. We'll go ahead and get these six flywheel bolts off and then check out the rear main seal after that. We have six T60s that we're gonna remove. So we have our Milwaukee impact. For those of you without an impact, what you can do instead is take one of the transmission bell housing bolts, thread it in, stick your pry bar through, have a second person hold the pry bar for you while you break the hardware free. Uh, the other thing you can do is get the flywall locking tool, which let me grab that right now. We're gonna use this for the install to make our lives a little bit easier, but I'll show you what that looks like while we have it out here. The flywheel locking tool is gonna to sit similar as you would uh, maybe a pry bar tool. We'll space it out properly. But the idea is that it sits in here, you bolt it down, 
and it literally does that. It locks the flywheel from moving. So we're going to use that uh, for the install of our new one. Uh, today we have, like we said, the genuine one, which we showed you at the intro. Uh, there's also an aftermarket one, which works exactly the same. And if you're trying to save a few more dollars, a uh, pry bar will work. Just be mindful that sometimes things can go very south when using the pry bar. So, all right, last bolt. Goes without saying, my good people, these are one-time use bolts. Please, please do not reuse them. All right, same deal. We're gonna have some dowels holding this in place. Just gonna wiggle it off. All right, my good people. And with that, here is our flywheel in all its glory with its tired springs. Dual mass of fury, baby. All right, we're gonna go ahead and set this down to the side, my good people. But here you have a very good view of what is our rear main seal in its current state, which is leak. So we are gonna go ahead and replace that. Uh, so with that, uh, what I wanna do first is just clean this up a little bit. I'm not gonna go crazy because we're gonna do a lot more cleaning. And then once we get that a little bit situated, we're gonna get the seal out and show you how to install the new one with the sealant. Let's get to it. We're gonna work on popping off the rear main seal. You know, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can spend a decent amount of money, get the proper BMW tool, which has about six uh, little metal screws that drill into pre-existing holes in the seal. Here's one that I'm kind of poking at right now. So there's six of these throughout the seal that they would screw into, and then you basically extract the seal from there. And you can use a special driver to drive in the new one. Most of us, including ourselves here, are not gonna have something like that. Uh, we can go ahead and just screw a regular screw into here and get that out. Uh, what we're gonna try first is just a nice angled pick. We're gonna get into the soft part of the seal, which is the interior bit here on the inside of the crank, and just kind of work on prying it out. We're not working, or we're not trying to mar the surface in here. We're not trying to mar the surface on the other side. We're just simply gonna try to pry it out, get this going, and then we can get our new one in. Any of the prying that we are doing is on the outside of the uh, crank here. It's not gonna hurt anything. We're not gonna damage anything. Nice big flathead does the trick. And pull that bad boy out. So it was just starting to leak, so it wasn't that bad. It's fairly clean back here. We're gonna go ahead and clean that up with some brake clean. Make sure we get any residual out with a nice towel. It's a nice clean towel here for us to use. I wanna make sure that this is nice and clean, free of any oil. We're gonna be using some special sealant to seal in our new one, which we'll show you in just a moment. You don't want to install it without it, otherwise it will leak. All right, my good people, looking at the rear main seal, I know we talked about it briefly at the beginning, whether we're going to dive into it or not. Obviously, at 250,000 miles. Have a drink every time I say the mileage. Um, it's going to be due. Obviously, it wasn't leaking terribly, but it was definitely starting to get there, and if we left it, it was only going to get worse. On the new seal, same as the old one, there's going to be two small divots, one on either side of the seal. This is where we're gonna put our initial primer. This is gonna help bond the two halves of the block, the top half and the bottom half, and just make sure that it's nice and tight and there is no leakage. It also helps keep the seal in place. For that, we're gonna use the 17-1000 or the 171,000 number from Loctite first. We're gonna brush that onto each little divot as we place it onto the back of the block. Let it sit for about a minute before we drive the seal in. Then we're gonna take the other Loctite product, the other sealant, you pop the back off of this. Pretty straightforward, it's just there for packaging. We're gonna load it onto our CTA tool, which comes with the kit. This is all like one little installation kit. I'm just gonna kinda, we're not gonna feed it up all the way up, but you kinda get the idea how it works. Kinda like a cock gun. We can pull this cover off, get our needle on, Lock that into place, it just twists. This is gonna be secondary. Once we have the seal in place and everything's nice and set, we're gonna squeeze this on either end of the divots as well. Once that's squeezed in, then you guessed it, we're gonna come back with the 171,000. We're gonna do a little bit over that and the block, over a little bit of the seal in the block, just to kind of lock everything in. And that's gonna help us uh, get another 250,000 miles out of the seal. So with that, Let's get this uh, 
it's almost like a driver guide tool that comes with the seal already from the factory. We're going to get this into place, get a little bit of the primer going and go from there. So we're going to take our seal. We have our dips lined up with the half of the case. I'm going to get this plastic guide tool kind of situated. Give it a couple love taps to get that up against our block as best as possible. All right, now we're going to go ahead and apply our primer on either dip of the seal. Now we're just going to push the seal in as far as we can by hand. Before we go all the way in, we're just gonna go ahead and let this sit for about a minute. I may have wiped that off, so I'm just gonna apply a little bit more. We're gonna let it sit about a minute to the air with the primer on, and then we're gonna drive it in the rest of the way using our small brass punch. All right, we have our seal in place. We have our plastic driver situated. We have our primer on either dip. It's been sitting for about a minute or so. We're just gonna push the seal in square as pretty much as much as we can, which is right about here. We're just going to push it in by hand as far as it will go. Then we're going to try using the old seal kind of as a driver uh, to get this one started at least. See if this will work. The old one's a bit mangled, so there's a good chance it's not going to do us any favors here, but it's worth trying. Now, of course, there are special tools dedicated to installing these seals or for people like you and me my good people are really only going to do this once um, this may be a better uh, alternative or solution so what ended up being the trick here is we took our old seal we flipped it backwards and then we used this to drive it most of the way in and then what i did is i just went and grabbed uh, one of the sleeves from our wheel bearing press tool kit here and it fit nicely inside of the uh, diameter of the old seal, which is all you know metal, uh, metal encased. So it stayed nice and even, and we used that to drive the seal in the rest of the way. So that worked in really nicely. Uh, another alternative that you can do is take a small uh, brass drift, something like this, and work the seal in all the way around, nice and gently. Take your time with it. Uh, it's very easy to deform the seal. I speak from experience. But with that, now we're going to take our second sealant. We're going to just get it taut within our tool here. And then as you probably guessed, we're going to go ahead and inject the needle on either dip of the seal where the block halves meet. And we're going to squeeze some of that in until it starts to dribble out just a hair. We'll give that a sec, and then we'll go ahead and reseal it with the primer one more time. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of going in a bit on the deeper side, squeezing it and just slowly pulling out the needle as I do that, just to make sure I get the full depth of the uh, seal taken care of, not just the outside. All right, now we have that situated. I'm just going to go ahead and dab a little bit more of primer over the top just to kind of seal everything in. We're going to do both the seal and the block, like so. All right, my good people. At this point, uh, we're ready to rock and roll. We'll give that a few minutes just to cure up, uh, make sure nothing's dripping or excessively leaking somewhere. Uh, just a note, before you start the car back up again, let's say you're super fast and you have this car back together in the next half hour, you want to let this sit for at least four hours before you run the vehicle. Uh, for us, this will probably take us a little bit longer with filming. So for now, we're just going to go ahead and get ready to reinstall our new flywheel. We'll show you how to use the locking tool. And for what it's worth, you saw us remove a bunch of these small torque screws that just hold this metal heat shield in place. We're just going to go ahead and reinstall those now so this isn't dancing around on us. There's no need really to remove this unless you had a ton of oil behind this that you wanted to clean up. As you can see, we left one up here, which is a little bit hidden to you now. So if you see these back in the next clip, it's simply just because I reinstalled them uh, since we don't really need to have this off. So. Catch you in a moment. Let's grab our flywheel. Now we're going to go ahead and install our flywheel. We have everything nice and cleaned up. Just a reminder, the same way you removed your old one, the new one also has a little opening on the back that is going to allow for this dowel to key it into place. You'll see you have one opening right here. That's going to be for the dowel. The other ones are bolt holes. So we're just going to try to do our best to line that up from the beginning. 
and you can kind of see through the body of the flywheel as you get this into place. That will allow you to kind of line everything up. All right. There we go. Give it a few wiggles back and forth, and that'll get it into place. With this up here, we're going to take our new T60 hardware. We're just going to get these started by hand using the T60 Torx bit. We're going to get one snug up, and then we don't have to worry about the flywheel falling down on us. The dowel pin does a pretty good job at holding it in, but you can't rely on that, especially with the weight of it. All right, now with that just snugged up, we're going to go ahead and install our locking tool. Again, if you don't have this locking tool, just use a transmission bell housing bolt and a pry bar, maybe a second set of hands. You can replicate the same thing. Just be very mindful and careful. You don't want to accidentally break uh, one of the teeth or damage one of the teeth on the flywheel. We're going to adjust this a little bit so that it works in our favor. There we go. I'm just using an old bell housing bolt. This tool is used on a lot of different uh, BMW engines. So there's different spacers and washers and whatnot that you can use to configure it. So just make sure you play with it a little bit and get what's best for you set up on your end. Right now I'm just snugging up an old E10 that we used from earlier that came out. Now with the E10 situated, we're going to grab our torque wrench and our T60. And in a crisscross pattern, we're going to torque all six of these T60 bolts down to 120 Newton meters. Nice and easy, my good people. Now we're going to get ready to feed our clutch disc and pressure plate on. Clutch disc and pressure plate should go back on the same way you removed it. In this case, you have the protruding side of the clutch disc facing the pressure plate. You have the more flat face side facing the flywheel. If you were to put it in the other way, it would never make contact, it would never work. So it really only goes on one way. Some brands actually label which way these units go, but in this case, it's pretty straightforward. No need to worry about it. Right now what I'm doing is I'm just installing our clutch alignment tool. Now this has a threaded bolt on the back, a small hex that we're gonna remove once it's in place. And then once we remove this, it'll allow us to remove the locking plate, which sits on the back of the pressure plate. This is standard on new uh, pressure plates like this. It's just a locking plate for shipping, keeps everything nice and happy. Uh, don't remove this until it's fully bolted down and torqued down, otherwise you're gonna have a, uh, a bad time. So for now, let's just keep everything together. Same thing with the pressure plate, there is dowels that help kind of line everything up. So you wanna make sure that you find those on the uh, flywheel and you find the dowels on the pressure plate. Those holes are typically a little bit bigger than the standard bolt hole ones. With that in place, it's easy to see that our clutch alignment tool is pretty dang centered. That means that the tool is going into the uh, pilot bearing on the flywheel. So now we're just gonna grab our, our hex hardware, get those started by hand, and then we can torque them down. Now we're gonna grab our six millimeter hex. We're just gonna snug these down in a crisscross pattern. Then we're gonna torque them down to 34 Newton meters. I'm going to use the electric impact on a low setting just to get us a little bit closer. All right, now we can go ahead and torque these down to 34 Newton meters. I'm going to use a small three inch extension. It's not going to hurt anything here just to clear the uh, pressure plate itself. And if this clutch alignment tool gets in our way, we'll just go ahead and remove the screw. But for now, we'll just keep it in there. We have the torque wrench set to stun aka 34 newton meters. We're gonna go ahead and snug these down. Same idea, crisscross pattern. It's okay if there's a little movement, that's just the dual mass flywheel maxing itself out on the other side. These I'm just gonna put a little bit of a torque seal on them just so that I know that they've already been torqued. All right, my good people. Now at this point, we're gonna go ahead and remove our hex tool. All right, for us, my good people, I found a T30 that fits in here nicely. Uh, maybe a four and a half or four mil hex will do the trick as well. Uh, the five is just a little too big, but a T30 fits in nice. It's just threaded into plastic, so you're not gonna risk really stripping anything here. And goes without saying, my good people, if you haven't done so already, make sure you just clean the surfaces of the pressure plate and the uh, flywheel before you install everything. 
Use a little bit of brake cleaner. Sometimes there's a little bit of residual oil on there or from grabbing it with dirty fingers, you want to get all that off. Then we're going to take a 14 millimeter hex. We have ours from the drain plug and fill plug on the differential. In the off position, we're going to rotate this plate off and out it comes. And then just with that, we can take our clutch alignment tool out. And now my good people, before we go ahead and install the transmission back on, we're going to go ahead and service the clutch fork, the pivot pin, the little clip, and the throw up bearing. And we're going to take a look at the guide tube. I'm going to guess it's pretty marred up, so let's go ahead and replace that as well. We'll do that on the workbench, and then we'll come back up and throw everything in.